expand our imagination. Justification for being what you are. Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Kaylee Hartung. The establishment and political outsiders broke even in last night's primaries. While Senator John McCain and Congressman Kendrick Meek easily defeated their opponents, newcomers Rick Scott in Florida and Joe Miller in Alaska are giving both parties something to worry about. Let's get some live reports from the ground on the two biggest surprises from last night. We're going first to Gainesville, Florida, where Rock the Votes' Blair Yancey is standing by. Hey, Blair, thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you. So, Blair, the big story in Florida this morning, Rick Scott shocked the GOP establishment. What are you hearing on the ground in Florida? What's the energy like? Well, yesterday I was on the ground at the University of Florida in Gainesville, and it's an exciting time for young people in Florida. Florida is a big deal, and now we know who's going to be in this contest. So in the governor's race, we see Alex Sink facing off against Rick Scott. And in the Senate race, we have a three-way contest between Kendrick Meek and Charlie Crist and Marco Rubio. So we know that elections in Florida are close, and it's really anyone's game. And I think the difference between winning and losing will be which candidates engage young voters. So talking about Kendrick Meek's victory, what are you guys doing to gear up for that election in November? Hands down, that is going to be one of the most closely watched races in November's elections. Absolutely. Well, we are on the ground to engage young people on campuses and in the community to get registered to vote and to get involved. Uh, for example, we've teamed up with university housing departments to provide a voter registration form and a letter from Rock the Vote, uh, which is signed by either the musician Jason Mraz or Good Charlotte. And these letters remind students to register to vote, um, informs them how to fill out the form and where to drop it off. Uh, we want to make sure that all the newly eligible young voters and the young people who have moved since the last election are up to date on their registrations and ready to vote in November. Great. Thanks, Blair. Now You're let's welcome. move all the way out west and get a reaction from the Daily Beast to Shoshana Walsh. She is in Alaska. Shoshana, are you there? I am here. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining us. So, Shoshana, it looks like Joe Miller is on the verge of pulling off one of the biggest upsets in election history in Alaska. What are you hearing on the ground? Yeah, well, it was a stunning night. It's a stunning morning. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it just is still so close. Uh, it, but it, it, I still think it will be quite difficult for for Murkowski to pull it off. But, uh, you know, it, it's still I don't see her conceding anytime soon. Uh, absentee ballots are still going to be sent in. The uh, the Division of Elections here in Alaska uh, sent out 16,000 absentee ballots. They have until uh, people have a week within the United States to send them back. But overseas and military families, which would be good for Joe Miller, especially because he's a combat veteran, they have until September 8th to send those in. So this could be going on for quite a while, and, and it may not be uh, over today or, or over really anytime soon. So we don't have a date. Absolutely not. And, it, you know, it could keep on, on going. But right now, with 90 almost 98 percent pre-tigs reporting it's it's very close to what it was last night with 51 percent miller and 48 percent murkowski so it's still a nail, nail biter but they she, murkowski has this thousand these vote gaps that she needs to overcome uh i guess through these absentee ballots i mean it will be difficult uh but it's going to be close and this is Alaska where they are, I mean, they are really going to count on these absentee ballots. In, now, now we're talking in 2008, which where was, there were more absentee ballots and it was a presidential election year. But Mark Begich was able to uh, claim victory over Ted Stevens. And this was in the week after the camp, after the election, by 3,000 uh, absentee ballots. And yesterday on Unplugged, we talked about Sarah Palin's momentum in Alaska. It looks like with this victory, she still got it. Yeah, and I, I do just want to quickly point out that I yesterday was not when I was in Washington Unplugged. I should have corrected uh, Jeff Zeleny from the New York Times, which I didn't, when he asked me about about uh, Sarah Palin not being at Ted Stevens' funeral. And I didn't correct him. She was there. So just so that we have that. But talking about this, uh, uh, what happened yesterday, I mean, it's an incredible victory for Sarah Palin, and uh, it is just it, it, before before she was uh, before yesterday, uh, people would 
t- constantly talk about her decline in um, in popularity here in Alaska and influence, and we really can't say that anymore. And it's interesting because yesterday when I was in the pool at the pool talking to people, a lot of people told me that that her. To, that Sarah Pill's endorsement of Miller really didn't matter, but that was just anecdotal, and we can see today that it really did have an influence, and um, and all that conventional wisdom is really out the window, as they say. And as you mentioned in your Daily Beast column today, this isn't Sarah Palin's first victory against a Murkowski. No, th- this is kind of a Hatfield-McCoy type of situation that's been going on for quite a while. Um, the biggest upset is that in 2006, when she, when Sarah Palin ran for governor, she had a GOP primary first, and she battled the incumbent Frank Murkowski, that's Lisa Murkowski's father, and she uh, was able to grab the the GOP primary for him, and then she she became governor that year. And what was interesting is last night at Election Central at the Egan Center, where all the candidates traditionally sit and wait, Lisa Murkowski was not there. But in 2006, that's where Frank Murkowski came to concede to Sarah Palin and, and congratulate her. And so being there, even though the Murkowskis and the Palins were not there, it was quite a flashback for anybody who had, who had uh, been reporting on that time or, or researched that. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today, Shoshana. Go uh, get thank some you. sleep. I know it was a late night. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and now let's turn to our roundtable discussion. These primaries were seen as a litmus test to see how well the Washington establishment could hold its own in this political summer of discontent. In Florida and Alaska, the picture is unclear. So how does this impact both parties with November fast approaching? Jamal Simmons is a Democratic strategist and Sherry Jacobus, a Republican strategist. And both join me now in the studio. So Sherry, let's start with you. The mm-hmm. headline for your party, Alaska. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't think there's uh, any question that the impact of Sarah Palin uh, is still very strong. Uh, and, and as you, know, you just had pointed out, uh, this was a bit of a rematch with the, with the Murska- Murkowski family because four, year, four years ago, this young upstart named Sarah Palin unseated uh, the incumbent in the primary. So uh, I think what we found is that this was more than just a Hatfield and McCoy situation, that this, in fact, uh, really matters. I think the impact of the Tea Party is clear. Uh, I don't think Republicans can rest easy because obviously the Tea Party is not uh, around just to help the Republican Party. They want to really affect uh, policy in this country. So it's not just a given that it's a it's a clear road for Republicans. They still have to work for it. Uh, and uh, I think the, the big news, I think the really big news uh, during this primary season is that for uh, the first time uh, for, for the better part of a century uh, in a midterm, the so-called off-year elections, uh, midterm elections, Republican primary turnout is through the roof and better than what Democrats have done. And I think that's the real problem area for Republicans, or for Democrats rather, in the fall, because clearly Republicans, uh, plus the Tea Party uh, movement, which isn't really, it, which isn't a party, uh, but it's certainly a movement that so far seems to be favoring Republicans, at least some Republicans, this is a huge a huge problem for the Democrats, that they, they seem unable uh, to energize uh, their voters to get out uh, in a primary season. So that's what's going to make the big, big difference in November. And Jamal, speaking of Democratic turnout in November, this Florida Senate race mm-hmm. is going to be a big deal for Democrats. The Florida Senate race is a big deal. So is the Florida governor's race. I mean, one thing that happens in Florida is the governor has a veto over any redistricting plans. So who wins the governor's race not only says something about how the state is governed, it also says something about how they pick the congressional districts for the next cycle. So um, right now, Alex Sink is looking very good. Um, you had a greater Republican turnout in Florida last night, but Alex Sink got more votes than, and she didn't even have an opponent, but she got more votes than uh, Scott did yesterday in that election. So, um, And they spent $70 million the Republicans did on their campaigns and and doing turnout and all that, while the Democrats did not do that, didn't spend as much money. So I do think uh, going into the fall, we feel pretty confident. If you look at what's happening in the Senate race, there's a variety of factors that are at play there. Um, you got Kendrick Meek, who's from the southern part of the state, but you've also got a ticket now that represents, um, ta- we've got candidates from there from Tampa, which is the central part of the state. You've got Kendrick Meek there from South Florida. Um, you've got people there from the northern panhandle. So you've got a variety, Orlando, you've got a variety of people um, on that entire state ticket that are really going to help drive out Democrats' turnout throughout the next, uh, throughout the fall. Here. Mm-hmm. And as the Miami Herald wrote this morning, Kendrick Meek doesn't have much time to savor his victory. The Miami Herald says he wakes up Wednesday somewhat bruised, very broke, and polling in last place behind a national Republican superstar, Marco Rubio, and the sitting governor, Charlie Crist. 
So what's the next step for your party down there? Well, what's going to be tough for Chris is he actually drew the he drew a bad straw last night because by having Kendrick Meek in the race, Democrats are probably, core Democrats are going to stick with Kendrick Meek. The question for Congressman Meek is, can he get his Democratic performance up to about 80, 85 percent? If he can get 80, 85 percent of Democrats, he should be able to win that race. Chris, on the other hand, is looking at trying to peel away some of those Democrats. People in the state tell me that Chris can probably expect to split about 50 percent of the independents. He may get about 25 percent of the Republicans, but he's going to need about 42 percent of Democrats in order to win that race. So if Kendrick can, be, can consolidate Democrats, Marco Rubio can consolidate Republicans, that could leave Chris sitting alone in the middle and you see a Democrat coming through there in the Senate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, but you know, but uh, Jamal, the one, the one uh, uh, group of Democrats that you seem to be, you know, forgetting about are the ones that are in the White House and, and, and the ones that are in Washington, the people that really control the money. And if, and if Meeks can't get President Obama and the establishment uh, Democrats who control the money, uh, then that's really a group he has to worry about. Now, we hear rumors that he's sort of given the message, sort of a, a, a wink and a nudge, that it's okay for the big money folks to start giving to Meeks. But, you know, the Democrats have a big problem in terms of who are they going to support. You know, it, Chris seems like the stronger candidate. He'll caucus with the Democrats. But Meeks is, is a traditional Democrat, and he obviously holds the African-American vote and the base. Uh, but he's got to do more than that. He's going to, he is the one that has to peel votes away from Charlie Crist. Uh, so the establishment Democrats, the leaders, in Washington that control the, the purse strings, uh, especially the president, have a big decision to make and anything less uh, than full vocal and 100 percent support for the Democratic candidate in Florida uh, is, going to, is going to hurt that candidate and uh, I think hurt the party. Well, a little bit of a Which test. Which I'm fine with, by the way. <laughs> a, little bit of the, a little bit of the test for uh, Kendrick Meek is going to be what can he do with his poll numbers in the near term? He's down to about $2 million. He needs to raise some more money. He needs to get those poll numbers up. Right now, he's in the teens. If he gets in the 20s, you'll see Democrats start to come back. And we think we'll get a bit, he'll get a little bit of a bounce out of last night. He's been looking very strong. And I think what happened in this primary is he got to be a tougher candidate and a better candidate. The, 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 the way he performed last night and over the course of the last couple of weeks is going to give a lot of Democrats heart. You should see him raise some money, raise those poll numbers, in which case I think more money will come to him as a Democrat, and then he'll be able to p- beat back any challenge from Charlie Crist pretty well. You're very optimistic. Yeah, very, very <laughs> rosy scenario. I think the problem is bigger, obviously. You know, Crist is the big elephant in the room, or former elephant, I should say, since he's no longer a Republican, and, and that's the big problem for Meeks. Meeks, Meeks just has to get uh, Obama there. I mean, there, there's no question. The Democratic Party, the DNC, uh, the DCCC, they have to come out full support uh, behind Meeks and put everything they have behind it, or no one's going to believe it. Everybody's going to think that this is this is a sign that you can give money to Chris. Well, you, you know, Sherry's Chris talking a lot about the, the impact it's going to have on and Kendrick Meek, but she's leaving off Marco Rubio, who is the Republican candidate in this race. And the truth is, everyone suspects that if Chris were to win this race, he doesn't have a lot of friends in his, old, his former party. So if he shows up in Washington, he'll probably show up in caucus as an independent Democrat, much like Joe Lieberman. And if that happens, that's bad for the Republicans. So Rubio, actually, and the Republicans have a big problem here. Here because I think you are going to see a food fight take place between Rubio and Chris because Rubio's got to beat Chris down and mm-hmm. keep him from becoming that much of a Which I think candidate. he can do. I think the momentum is with Rubio. I mean, he's a rock star now. Uh, he's relatively new to the scene. We're learning about him nationally just in the past 18 months. Uh, the momentum is with him. I don't think that Charlie Crist has garnered a lot of goodwill uh, from Republicans. There might be some loyalists out there uh, who, who stick with him. Uh, maybe he'll drop off after last night. So I, I, I think that, uh, that uh, Rubio is the one with, with uh, you know, the wind at his back. And a lot of that momentum behind Rubio would be attributed to the Tea Party, Sarah Palin yeah. endorsements, and, yeah. and that idea. How, how are her endorsements going to fare in November? Uh, you know, I, I, I think it'll be a mixed bag, to be honest. I think there's some areas where she's clearly uh, very, very strong, but I don't think that uh, uh, candidates should rely just on a, a Palin endorsement to get them over the finish line. I think that the, the, the fiscal conservative message is very, very strong, and if they stick to that, talking about jobs, talking about the spending in Washington, uh, that's what the Tea Party movement is about. But the Tea Partiers, again, they're not a party and they're not the Republican Party. Uh, they are keeping all candidates and office holders in check. They're sending a big message. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Palin is obviously a part of that. She's not the leader of, of the Tea Party. She might be considered one. Uh, but they're you know, t- trying to define the Tea Party movement and the people in it as, as being you know, all, all on the same page about everything is like herding cats. You know, it can't be done. And that's really to their advantage because uh, when, when the left comes out and tries to ridicule them uh, and, and marginalize them, it just makes them stronger. So it's, it's, fasc- it's a fascinating time in American politics to watch the impact of the Tea Party movement. Absolutely. Well, and, we're gonna- and what you're noticing here is you're noticing the Republicans trying to distance themselves 
falls a little bit from the Tea Party now they're moving into the general election because the Tea Party is great at turning out primary voters. But the question is, do these Tea Party candidates that they've drawn a lot in all these states, are these candidates actually going to be able to compete among the general elected and among electorate and independents in the fall? And I think the jury's out on that. Democrats feel pretty confident if you look at places like Kentucky with Rand Paul uh, and some of these other states that we, we pr we've picked a pretty good crop of Republican candidates to run against in a year where we really ought to be in much more trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll have two more months to debate this and <laughs> an election in November to keep an eye on. So big thanks to both Thank of you, you for joining thanks us for today. Me. And that's it for Washington Unplugged today. Catch us here every day on CBSNews.com. I'm Kaylee Hartung. Have a great day. If we don't expand our imagination, we've got to be more to us.